Hello everybody and welcome to the very first Adventures Hangout. So some of you may already know the blog Adventures from the Bedrooms of African Women and some may not, but do go and check us out at www.adventuresfrom.com. My name is Nana Dakwa and I'm one of the co-founders of Adventures alongside this woman, Malaika Bet. And today we are here with a number of guests. We are here with Onu, who is a multi-passionate woman. She runs a personal development company called Refresh with a Kene. She's also a writer. She's the writer of the club, a new book coming out. I'm sure she'll tell us more about that towards the end of the call, but she's here as one of our guests. We also have and for those of you who are regulars on adventures, will know and love Ekuba, an amazing writer, also a human rights lawyer, proudly queer, and she has written so many exciting stories for adventures, and we're really happy to have Ekuba here. So these three ladies are going to be my guests, and we shall be talking about reconciling sex with our faith. In some ways, it seems to me like a bit of an oxymoron, but maybe it's not, and this is what our resource persons are going to help us find. And I actually want to start by going to Malaika, because Malaika is in the unique position of actually having practiced two faiths. Malaika was um, raised as a Muslim, converted to Christianity. So Malaika, what has the two different religions said about sex? Have there been commonalities, differences, in your opinion? In my opinion, I think that they have shared quite a bit of commonality in the sense that, um, you know, the it was preached that a girl should not have sex until marriage. Um, I didn't see any difference growing up as a Muslim um, and what the Quran said about sex and what um, I experienced as a Christian growing up or when I had my conversion in university and what the Bible or at least um, my pastor taught us about sex and that sex was um, something that should be sacred and should be had with your husband um, and your husband exclusively and that you know adultery is a sin so I think that in that sense the two religions are pretty much they correlate on the same level and that's been my experience Thanks for sharing that. Now, a lot of the time, I feel like when I say we, at least speaking as a Ghanaian and an African, I feel like a lot of the time we tend to focus on Christianity and Islam, like those are the only two faiths. Meanwhile, there's, there's so many other faiths. I'm wondering if anybody else has experience of other faiths. Um, I guess lack of faith. I might not say sorry. I guess lack of faith. So I don't know what that registers as. Say that again, Ekuba. We couldn't hear you properly. Oh, I, I said that I'm agnostic. Oh, I, I said that I'm agnostic. Brilliant. So Brilliant. I don't know what that so I don't know what that registers as. Whether it's a lack of faith or it's a faith in itself. You probably been the best. You probably be the best person <laughs> to tell us that. <laughs> but then, I'm just curious, Ekuba, were you at any point um, a member of a faith-based organization, and what led to you becoming agnostic? Yes, I was. Yes, I was. Yes, I was. Mm. Well, it's a well, it's a, well, it's a long story. So it was basically a journey for me from. Um, Christianity because I was born into a Christian family and then somewhere along the, the, the line I became a very fundamental Christian and then eventually I became agnostic. And actually it's tied to sex so I guess it's really happy for this discussion. Perfect, so tell us what happened. Oh it's tied to sex, I couldn't hear that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> very interesting, I'm very curious. Well, so basically, I think when I was raised in a Christian home where it was illegal to do like a lot of things, every sex was banned besides sex in marriage. And 
even with sex in marriage, there were particular acts that some pastors considered illegal, like oral sex, anal sex, they were out of boundary. So I basically started with the church till I was um, 23 years. 23 years was like the year that a lot of things kind of changed for me. And then I started having sex with a guy. And basically, I found that a lot of the things that they told me were lies. Because, um, <laughs> so for example, I had grown up on this steady diet of if you ever went to sleep with someone, you would die, you know, or bad things would happen to you, like you dead or things like that. And then I went to have sex with someone and it was wonderful and I didn't feel any of those things. So I started losing faith little by little. And then, of course, since I was four years, I've known, sorry, since this age of four years, I've known that I was fair. So I kind of kept that on the back then also when I was a Christian. So along the way, reconciling that also was something that eventually led to me moving away from the church. So, yeah. So in a sense, for you, Kuba, it was impossible to reconcile your sexual life with that of your faith. See, that's the interesting thing. It was actually possible. At the very point where it was possible was the point where I decided to leave. Because when I had a year abroad to study for my master's degree, and then I found myself in San Francisco, and there were a lot of affirming churches in San Francisco for people that are queer or LGBT. So I was attending a church like that, and for the first time, I actually got to read like the Greek and Armenian translations of the well the Armenian version of the Bible and realize that all that I had talked about in church about homosexuality being an offense was like a low bull or whatever. But at that exact time when I could have reconciled my faith with sex was the time that for other reasons I decided to be diagnostic. Right. Okay. And it's been your experience, Akene, of sex and faith, you know, like Kubo was saying, for a lot of people, there's a lot of guilt associated with sex, the sort of messages we get growing up, especially if you're growing up in a very religious home. And for a lot of women, even if they decide to have a conventional way, i.e. have sex when they are married, you know, there's still a lot of, I guess, guilt from childhood, from what they've been told growing up. Um, what's your what's your experience? Hmm, this is a hot topic. Okay, so I think when you talk about faith, there's doctrine, there is people's interpretation, and there is a personal relationship. So for me, my faith, I'm Christian, and I did grow up, uh, I've had fundamental experiences, I attend a semi-Pentecostal kind of church now, um, but faith is a very personal thing for me, right? And I think when I was younger, yeah, I also had that same. I, I didn't believe I would die. <laughs> well, actually, I, I believed I might die, but not because of anything, you know, not because of the forces of heaven, but the forces of my mother. Now, <laughs> so that kept me on the straight and narrow. Um, but when I made the decision, so I didn't, I also was not... Um, to be transparent, I believe it's best. So what I would teach my daughter, listen, I think that the Bible preaches sex outside of marriage as something to avoid for a, for a reason, not as a rule to hold you back, but as a way to protect you. And that's what I will teach her. Now, that being said, I, to be transparent, I will also tell her, I didn't do that, okay? And I also, um, this is what I did. So if you fall, you're not broken. You're not, it's not over for you, right? You're not going to be struck down by the lightning. God is not going to cast you out of his heart. And um, and then you talked also, the question was very deep, right? You also talked about in marriage, you know, guilt. So guilt and shame, I think they go hand in hand. So when you, when you feel like you can release the shame and you can be in an open relationship with God and converse freely, like, hey, this is how I'm feeling. This is what's going on. And you can go to the word for yourself. 
and seek guidance for yourself. I think that the level of shame that you feel, even when you feel like you've done something outside of God's will for you, that shame is not part of his plan for you. And so when you don't have that shame holding you back, guilt is no longer part of the equation. When you are able to forgive yourself and move forward, I'll have a clear understanding of what his will for you is. Now in marriage, I think, yes, yeah, some people probably have issues around sex. Or in relationships, you know, people, oral sex, someone mentioned, um, other different things. Um, well, I believe the marriage bed is sacred. Like, sacred as in for two for two people. The la you know, you bring a third party in, that's kind of where you draw the line. But what you can do, you and your spouse, I think that's something that you have to come to an understanding for yourself. And um, I've had pastors, so I run a... A fellowship for women. Every so often we get together and we have a girls' night in. And one of our nights in, we actually had a pastor come. She's a woman pastor, very funky. And um, she taught on oral sex. And she taught on how to do it right. Which was <laughs> kind of like blew my mind, right? But um, very, it was very uh, affirming and empowering for the women that were there. Because it was saying that, listen, sex is something to be enjoyed. You're with your spouse, you're with someone you love and trust. You know, and God wants this for you. So he wants you to be, pleasure, you know, be happy, prosper. Isn't that part of prosper? So um, I don't think that the guilt and the shame is necessarily from God. I think that is from man and an interpretation of the, you know, people's own interpretation of the Bible and using it to pe keep people confined. I don't think that's God's plan for us. I don't think we're meant to be confined and meant to feel bad. But then I've talked too much, so someone else. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're not talking too much at all. No, that's interesting. Um, and I like what you said about you don't think shame as part of God's plan for us. Which also makes me think of, you know, people of no particular faith people who may be agnostic, people who may be atheist, um, and some of the feedback I hear from people is, you know, um, gosh, it's just gone out of my head. <laughs> That's so funny. But I was thinking of, yes, people of no particular faith. The challenge being, if you're somebody of faith, a lot of religions, the monotheist religions, will say you can only have sex within marriage. What if you're a single woman and you want to have sex and you have no intention of getting married? Or you don't want to just get married so you can have legal sex? What kind of options exist for you then? Malika, do you have any thoughts that you want to share? Well, again, you know, I think it, are you asking specifically from a single woman who ascribes to a monotheistic um, religion or a single woman who is agnostic or atheist? Actually, if you could take the latter, just to give you a, a bit of a challenge. Okay, a woman who's an atheist. So if you if you have if you have no faith, and this is just my thinking, then you have nothing to reconcile. You don't ascribe to any particular and I'm not an atheist, so I don't know. So if any atheists are out there listening, please feel free to leave a, a message or a tweet us. But my thinking would be that if you don't ascribe to any particular set of rules or mores regarding sex or even morality, um, you know, then maybe the rules don't apply to you in this manner. So, you know, you're an atheist. You know that murdering people is wrong, but you don't fear God. So you might go ahead and murder somebody because you don't believe in God. You don't believe that, you know, that judgment will come. And maybe you're not afraid of going to jail either. In the same way, if you're an atheist, you know, you don't have the same sort of qualms about having sex with someone who you're not married to because you don't believe that marriage is an institution that was created by God and that the marriage bed is holy. So... I don't think that a single woman in her 20s who doesn't serve a particular God would have any qualms about, you know, having sex with multiple partners, maybe even in the same day or whatever. That's just an extreme. Um, I don't think that there would be anything to reconcile in that instance because, you know, you don't have that, that tension or contention within you, you know, um, to prevent you from doing that. Can I, can can I just can add? Yes, Sorry. go on. Sorry, Malaka, I wanted to jump in and um, 
an add-on to what you were saying because I think that there's a slight difference between faith and morality. So someone can be of no faith but have certain moral codes that they abide by. So I think the question that Nana was posing may, you know, could be adjusted, right? So it's not, the assumption is that just because you're a person of faith, that you have a certain moral code that is um, in line with that, right? Because there are a lot of people of faith that you have a lot of adulterers, etc. You know, and they go to church quite happily, so <laughs> their moral code must allow for that. And I think that there are people that I've met that are not, I've never been atheist or agnostic, um, but I have met many people in that, that practice different faiths or not at all, like you said. And it depends on what their moral code is. I've met some people who are even more fundamental than the fundamental Christians, but they don't ascribe to any faith at all. So I think it depends on what their own personal moral code is. I would and, agree um, with that. I mean, mm -hmm. but then, oh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. No, 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 go ahead. <laughs> I, I think that when you don't have, um, when you're not part of an organized faith, then you are somewhat at liberty to create your own moral code. So like you said, they might be more moral, but then moral morality then becomes, yeah, um, you know, kind of a great area. So mm -hmm. it's like we, we pick and choose what is, what is moral and what is not. Mm -hmm. If that makes it sense. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I wanted to chip in here, I guess as an agnostic that I disagree. Like, <laughs> in the first place, I would be really kind of scared of anyone that tells me that if it were not for my religion, I would kill you in a heartbeat or I would cheat on you if I were married to you. I don't believe that morality stems from religion. On the contrary, I think that there are a lot of atrocious crimes that have been committed and are committed daily by people that really believe that they are religious and believe that they are serving God. Absolutely. For me, as an agnostic person, I don't need to read a piece of scripture or anything like that before I get my morality. I'm in a committed relationship with my girlfriend. I wouldn't cheat on her because I don't believe in harming people in that way. So that is my code of morality. I didn't do something that harms someone. So I kind of disagree that if someone doesn't practice a particular faith, then suddenly everything is like free for all and they don't have any standards whatsoever or they can go the whole you know, nine years. I don't think so. Well, I, you know, I, I hear what you're saying, and I think I just want to clarify, I don't think that's what Malako is saying, or even I. I think what, what she was saying is that you're free to determine your own moral code for yourself. So you oh. have said you don't believe in hurting your girlfriend that way, and that's something you've determined for yourself, and it's not by any set of rules, right? Not by any scriptural rules or whatever, and that's great. So you have the right to determine that, and I think that's what she's saying. That I think I we're guess, all actually saying the same oh, thing. Sorry. No, I guess what I was trying to say is that I think that despite whatever religion everyone practices, everyone at some point chooses what they will abide by. Mm -hmm. For example, the reason why I decided to leave being a Christian is that it got to a point where I realized, apart from so many other things, you know, but I got to a point where I basically realized that everyone claims that they are a Christian and people claim they are Bible believing, but there's not a single human being in the world today that is going by the standards that the Bible has said totally. For example, a lot of people make a lot of noise about homosexuality and stuff, but then I doubt that the same people would say that if a woman is being beaten by her husband, she should remain in her marriage. And yet Jesus did say that if you divorce for any reason apart from adultery, you are committing adultery yourself, and we know that adulterers are supposed to go to hell. So I think that everyone, whatever religion you go by, at some point you make the decision that I'll pick this one, I'll leave this one, and it's the same thing that agnostics and atheists do, I think. Brilliant. Brilliant. Thank you so much. I want to go back to the issue of sex. Um, basically because on Adventists we love sex and we love to talk about sex. Um, how do people get away from the guilt they may have about sex because of messages they have been getting over and over again in their youth, you know? So whether it's a case where you've come to a situation where you formed your own, uh, you've formed your own values for yourself, you've decided whatever code you want to live your life by, how do you manage to get rid of that baggage from childhood? I'll start with you, Akini. <laughs> of course you would. Um, well, I was trying to, I was thinking about the question when you were asking it, and um, 
to be honest, I, I can I, I can at least speak for me, right? Um, and you know, this is in the context of faith. So when I became sexually active, and I was still a Christian, how did I reconcile, or how did I leave that baggage behind? And I have to be honest, initially it was difficult, right? Because you've you've fallen from a standard that you set for yourself, or that has been set for you. But what really made the difference for me and this is what I this is why I'm a Christian today was getting into relationship with God and I say that because it's different from being a Christian on paper where you're doing things based on obligation was getting into a relationship understanding that it's not about walking a perfect walk it's about having a relationship with yourself right so being somewhat self-aware okay I've done this what does this really mean for me how do I feel you know just really being honest with yourself does it do I feel good about it do I feel empowered in this relationship do I feel you know there was a whole era I was talking with Laka a while ago and we were talking I was telling her I had a whole sex in the city area not to say that I was quite like the girls on there because they're very sexually liberated but as in you have this whole era where you're being taught that it's empowering to be out there and just doing it and doing whatever um, and I didn't quite buy that but at the same time you're it, it's it was part of the messaging at the time and was conflicting with the message of my youth so I had to come up with something that made sense for me and what made sense for me was to really see what was going on with me and check myself right so if I was single today I think that I would be choosing a path of abstinence and and I'm very open about sex and very um, I talk about it frequently I don't have a problem with it I don't have any shame associated with it what I also know that for me though it's a very spiritual and a very um, it's more than just the physical it's a very um, it's deep, for lack of a better word, right? It, hopefully it's deep, right? So, for lack of a better word. And it's something I don't take lightly, mm -hmm. right? It's an opportunity, it's a blessing, it's a gift. And so I don't want to use it against myself. And I think that when you are being promiscuous, and, and that's a judgmental term, but it's the only term I know how to use right now to explain if you're having multiple partners, if you're being indiscriminate about that you might put yourself in a position where you are hurting yourself spiritually emotionally you know and I deal and I work with women and often because um, I'm open people are open to share and I hear stories and I know that it's not um, despite what the media tries to tell you that sometimes when we go out there and we try to have sex like men or they say men do not all men have sex like that we tend to be broken it hurt, hurts us internally not every woman of course but for some so for me it's not just about I'm not trying to tow anybody's line I'm not trying to live by anybody's rules I am connecting to myself and connecting to God inside of me mm -hmm. and using that as a as a you know as a, what's the word as some sort of a gauge you know, when I get outside, I know how I feel, and I, I'm, in, I'm trying to be in touch with my spirit, and I know, oh, this is not working for me, and so I don't feel like I, ha I owe it to anyone to, to be one way or another, and so I can recon I reconcile my past that way. Like, okay, this is not. I don't believe. Like, for example, there. Yeah, I also heard those messages. Oral sex is wrong. Blah blah blah. That's you. You know, there are people <laughs> that believe lipstick is wrong or a little cleavage. I do both. And I'm okay with that. So, um, and I don't feel like I'm any, any less connected to God. So, um, I think that it really is about a level of self-awareness and, and understanding that God is not as far from us as we think, but we walk with Him daily. He's with us daily, continually, and um, it's a very uh, connected relationship. Hmm. Talked a lot. Yeah. I don't know if I. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> In terms of you know getting over some of the messages you may have been given as a child around sex. Mm -hmm. Say it again. I missed what you said. Sorry, Eko, are you there? Oh yes, I am. Yes. That question addressed to me. Yeah. Yes. So that question was addressed to you. I was asking about your thoughts on how you've been able to get over some of the some of the negative messaging you might have received around sex as a child. And oh. I think that um, for me, one of the steps was to just read really widely because I noticed that sometimes when you are in a particular religious group, 
they might tend to, and not just a religious group, any group actually, which is like overrun with power or whatever, they might try to restrict their members trying to read why because it opens your mind to a lot of things. So the first step for me was to research everything and not just to take it hook, line, and sinker. I had to go back to the Bible and ask that when I was a practicing Christian, but even now, ask that which particular verse in the Bible says that it's wrong to have sex. Read them in their original translations if possible. Read around what people have said about that verse, theologists and all of that. And as I reading that come to my own personal conclusions, I, it became really helpful to me to get to a point where I was doing what I genuinely felt convicted to do, not what my pastor had said or what I had read in the book or what Christians for like 2,000 years had done. You know, so that was the first step for me, basically. But the next step for me, moving into becoming an agnostic, sorry, was to continue asking those questions. There, are, I feel as an agnostic that there are a lot of questions that society suppresses you from asking. For example, <laughs> when you say, when people say, for example, that they are atheists and don't believe in God, a lot of people will say that, oh, but then the world looks really, you know, like there are lots of pressing things in creation and how could that not have been created by someone? And then you ask these same people that, okay, so then if someone complex created these complex things that we see, then surely that complex person must also have been created by another complex being. He or she couldn't have sprouted up from the sky one day, could they? And then at that point they tell you, oh, no, 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 you know, don't think about all these things. You shouldn't think too far, too much thinking and reading why it makes people become foolish and things like that. So basically what I'm saying is that my advice to anyone that would want to reconcile their sex life with their faith or to to analyze whether what they've been taught, taught in their faith is right or whatever, is just to read wide, to think, to talk to people. Don't limit yourself, you know, yes. And go with your heart also, what you feel deep down, yes. Sounds like very good advice, Kuba. Definitely sounds to me like good advice, reading widely, taking decisions for yourself, thinking things too. And on the subject of reconciling sex with faith, I want to move on to talking about actually writing about sex. So I'm sure you can guess, Malaika, that I'm coming to you, right? <laughs> of course. <laughs> you are in a unique position because you write about sex, you blog for adventures, um, Daughters of Swallows had a lot of context around sex as well. How have you reconciled your life as in a sense, a sex blogger, with also being a deacon's wife. Well, I want to say I'm not in so unique a position because we have a Kenny as well, who <laughs> uh, <laughs> pastors women and mentors women has also written a book around sex. So I'm in good company in that sense. Mm -hmm. um, but um, it was it was very difficult for me in the beginning. I actually haven't told many people about um, my book in my church because um, they have very or my church has very I don't know whether to call them high standards, but for lack of a better term, high standards around the subject of sex and that um, it's, it's, sex should be something sacred and holy and should be between um, a husband and a wife, which, you know, there's absolutely merit to that, um, I believe, if you ascribe to that, to that notion. If, if that is, you know, your moral code or your religious leaning, then yes, then that's, there's nothing wrong with that. Um, but my husband um, had serious issues um, with the book because, you know, he's in a position um, in the church, um, you know, as a deacon. But my position as an author, I wasn't writing as a deacon's wife. I was writing um, as, as a woman who wanted to tell the story of other women. And these are very real stories that I had heard. Um, you know, some of them, some of it is hyperbole, some of it is, is actually fact. Um, and I wanted to write these stories. And part of real life is real sex. And people experience sex in different ways. Um, you know, there are people who, like a Cuba, are in same-sex relationships. There are people who are in violent sexual relationships. There are people who are, um, who are abstinent. And for their own reasons, they've chosen to be in this relationship or another or this type of relationship or they've settled for it. Um, and so it was my job as an author just to tell that story and not to judge my characters or judge their experiences that I wanted to pen. 
I think that's okay. I think that's very interesting. I like what you said about not wanting to check characters, but I also want to challenge you because you said your church has very high standards around church, around sex. Did you feel and you haven't felt comfortable telling a lot of people in your church about your book? Um, is your concern that you'll be judged by people in your church? My concern is that I will go off at the mouth and end up hollering and screaming because I, I have, you know, <laughs> very poor impulse control. So why, you know, put yourself in a situation to create a fight when it's not necessary? I mean, you know, if you run out in the middle of the freeway, you're going hit, to get hit by a truck. So why do it? So I don't bring it up. It's not a subject um, that I wish to discuss with anybody in my church. And I know that there are people in my church that are aware of the book, but none of them has said anything to me um, because I guess I have a reputation for having poor uh, impulse control or whatever. So, yeah. yeah. That made me laugh. And Kenny, you, you, you also, um, you're very active in your church. You run a women's fellowship. You wrote the Mercer's Club. I'm looking forward to reading it, especially because I've heard it's quite sexy. And I like reading books that are quite sexy. Did you have any sort of backlash with your book, especially being a Christian? Um, yes and no. Right. Um, so my book is about relationships, and sex is a part of relationships. So the issue that came up when I first um, released it. So the Moses Club was written in 2008, and um, it's been re-released this end of this month on Kindle. And what uh, the Mrs. Club is just about relationships. And there were single women, and I wanted to tell a true story, just like Malatha said, not judging my characters, and really just paint the picture. So there were a few scenes that. I didn't think we're terribly graphic, but you know, I had to paint the picture. And um, so I, I remember that I got quite a few uh, notes from people, and um, some people told me straight up, "Oh, I like the stories, but I didn't feel like you needed to be that, you know, graphic." Um, I had one or two people tell me that this is straight up pornography, which it is not. I must say, <laughs> it is not. But um, especially considering that we live in a world that has Fifty Shades of Grey and other things like that, Zane, etc. Is there nothing like those? Not even there. But for Nigerian, and this was in Nigeria, it's you know, people who have a very um, conservative way of looking at things. Yeah. So there was a little backlash. Now the interesting thing is, I didn't have backlash necessarily at my church. I also, Malaka, did not do a big splash telling people about the Mrs. Club. I have a non-fiction book that I wrote that is more Christian, and I told people about that. But the Mrs. Club, I did it. And then I would have people come up to me saying, hey, aren't you, I just read this book, are you the one? And I would say yes. And I would say I'm a little bit, um, I'm always, I'm my own person, right? So I don't mind being a little bit different. But what is important to me is that it does, I don't want anyone to be hindered in their, in their uh, journey to God, right? So I write what I believe. I, don't, I wrote these characters with love. Uh, I wrote about women. They're fictional, but if they were real, I would invite them into my home. I would spend time with them. I would enjoy their company. So despite, regardless of what their experiences are. And I feel the same way, period, about anybody. So I think that sex is a part of people's lives. I write freely about it because it's a true. It's true. It's real. It's honest. When I was single, it was true. It was real. It was honest. And I don't think I was any less for having done that when I was single. And I don't think anybody else is any less for having done that. And I think we should be a little bit more honest about it and open. People are doing all kinds of things, you know, and uh, getting dressed and going to church afterwards. And this, you know, hey, I think we should just put it on the table, be honest about it, talk about these things, demystify it, right? And just put it out there, because what happens is when we make it into something that is shrouded in shame and shrouded in, you know, it's disgusting or whatever, then you actually put women in a very disempowered position, young girls especially, and they find themselves in situations and they don't have anyone to talk to. Right. So I would much rather, I think it's actually very important for Christian women to become open about sex so that the younger ones have a place to go. And not they're not trapped in a place where they don't have anything. They can't talk. They can't be honest. So I write freely because um, it is real, like Malaka said, and um, it's easier for me to write about it actually than um, anything else. <laughs> mm -hmm. 
I completely agree with you in terms of it's easy to write about sex than anything else. At least that's the way I feel as well. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me make sure I'm not this, as in I can write about other things, but it's easier to write about sex than to talk about than it. Than to talk to, about it. Yeah. I don't want to get it confused. <laughs> I get what you mean. I get what you mean. But as she was speaking, Akene, the other thing that came to mind for me is that, you know, with all of the conversations we tend to hear about, you know, all these rules faith-based organizations have around sex and sexuality, you would expect churches, mosques, all sorts of faith-based organizations to be safe spaces for people. You know, so you don't expect people to be getting abused in the, in the church. But this is something that we hear of quite a lot, yeah. you know, on a regular basis. Um, Ikuba, I'm going to come to you because I know you're going to be starting a series um, on adventure shortly called Sex in the Church. And from some of the conversations that we've had, you know, I know you've had some not so positive experiences um, um, in terms of people who are members of the same church you've been on, you know, sexually harassed. Can you share some of those experiences with us? Oh, yeah, of course. So what basically happened was um, in my early 20s was when I became like a fundamentalist Christian. And what happened was, it was due to two reasons. First of all, I got to a stage where I just wanted to be, I mean, I thought about the fact that I just want to be close, like the concept of God, and I just want to be really close to God and do everything I can. And then the second reason is that when I turned 18, I was diagnosed with a disease that is sort of a disability. And it affects like one in, let's say, 100,000 people, I think, is a statistic. So if you are an African or a Ghanaian in today's Africa, and then you are infected with a disease that affects like one in 100,000 people, a young person, obviously what would come to your mind in this era of TV programs of everyone being healed and falling down and everything. So basically I bought into the idea that I was probably sick because I had been infected by a demon or people would say you have stepped on something and that was meant for someone else, like a case meant for someone else anyway. To cut a long story short, because of all these reasons, I became a really fundamentalist Christian because I wanted to do everything I could to be close to God and be totally healed and live a fabulous life. So somewhere along the line, I realized that there were a lot of people like me in the churches I was attending. Now, I always joke with my friends that my experience is unique because they will mention some church. You know, I feel like a lot of Christians, especially in Accra, are just used to, you know, the huge charismatic churches that you go and wear your suit and tie and stuff. But then they haven't really gotten to know about, like, you know, the churches like in the hinterlands in Ghana and the places you go and pray on some mountains and stuff. I experienced all that stuff. So along that the way, I had a lot of experience myself and people around me also had a lot of experiences that I thought were interesting and I would like to share. For example, when I was in the uni, I had a friend that was dating a pastor in one of the churches. And it was interesting because it was a group of girls in my university class that were attending this particular church. It was like a small church that was starting up. And the pastor got all of us convinced that our family members were witches. The pastor told me that one of my family members was a witch, and you can find how <laughs> bizarre I was that I would meet the person. And then, apart from that, it was a very abusive relationship. The pastors were dating uh, those of us that were attending, it, that were university students. And one of the pastors was physically abusive to my friend. But I don't know, everything was explained away because this was a man of God that was doing miracles. People were experiencing healing from diseases that you've not heard about because of this man. So how could you think anything was wrong when he did it, you know? And I had a lot of similar experiences. I joined a particular, another very famous group because at some point in time, I have I had an abusive past. So at some point in time, I think what I basically needed was some mental health assistance, like assistance in the form of mental health. But I think that mental health care professionals in Ghana are limited, you know, so far as their numbers are concerned. And I think that generally the church and then the the church and people don't encourage you to seek mental help. I've been in several services where the pastor would say during the sermon that there's no need in going to see a psychologist when Jesus is the original healer and there's nothing a psychologist can do for you and stuff. 
So then I decided to go and see a counselor. I think I was like 20, 20, maybe one years or something when this happened. I don't remember the exact age. But it led to a lot of things to the point where the church counselor had me in a hotel room and basically had us sleeping with me. Now that I think about it, I would put that sexual experience as it wasn't really consensual. Mm -hmm. But then it happened. And after it happened, I felt devastated and wanted to find some justice. So I approached the church leaders. It was really futile. Eventually, they sanctioned him, but the sanction they gave to him was they didn't talk about it at all. They hashed the issue and just said he shouldn't preach, I think, one month or something. And guess what? <laughs> Recently, I was at home when my sister told me that, go and check your email. I sent you an email. I went to my email. There was a link to a blog that this man has started up. And in the blog, he indicated that he's still in the business of counseling people. And he's even taking it further. He's now counseling like secondary school age girls and stuff like wow. that. Wow. So these are some, I have a lot of experiences, basically. <laughs> I have a lot. These are just a few. There was a church, another church that I attended, the last church that I attended, actually, which is a huge name, charismatic church in Ghana. I was working in the pastor's office, Pro Bono. And besides the fact that they were using my skill, my legal education and so many other skills I had and not paying me anything while they took a lot of money themselves. There were so many things that went on that put me off the church. So eventually I was working as a, a lawyer for the head of the men's fellowship, who was also a lawyer. And then his wife was the head of the women's fellowship. And it became this bizarre triangle where it got to a point where he, my boss, that would stand in front of the church and say all these things, was sending me erotic text messages. And then his wife intercepted these text messages at some point, and he came to the office, and it was a whole other, <laughs> it was like a soap opera something episode or something like that. Anyway, so yeah, these are some of my experiences that I have had in church so far as sex is concerned. Wow. Can I jump in here real quick? I know. I, I know. I'm like, go ahead. <laughs> I, can, I know <laughs> you want to jump in. Here in. Too. <laughs> I <know>. Go <laughs> ahead, mean, Malaka. It's um, I, I live in Atlanta, so I just want to go ahead and, and make that distinction. And um, similar things do happen in the church in Atlanta as well. I mean, you hear about pastors, you know, just sleeping with uh, co-pastors' wives, you know, so so and so. Um, molesting little kids in the church, youth pastors, and so forth. And I think that it would behoove any person, and I, I, I haven't been to a mosque in, in years, so I don't know if similar things happen in mosques or, you know, or, or other religions, but I assume they would as well because it's part of human nature. And it would be, behoove anybody who um, wants to, who is seeking a relationship with God to really scrutinize what's going on in the house of worship that you're going to. Because when I was in Ghana, I was surprised there would be eight churches on one road. At my dad's house, from his house to the junction, there were literally eight churches because the, the business of church in Ghana is big business. You make a lot of money because people are looking for a miracle. People are looking for an answer. And you have unscrupulous men and women who are preying upon people, preying upon their, their faith and their naive, naivety. So, I mean, Ikuba, I'm, I'm sorry. I know that I'm not God. I'm not Jesus. I'm not your pastor. But I am sorry that, you know, that people have misrepresented Christ and God in this manner because this is obviously not what God intended. Um, it's just my mind is blown. Kenny, please go. <laughs> <laughs> no, I know. I feel the same way. I'm, I'm, I'm literally heartbroken listening to your stories, and I, I have to say thank you, Akuba, for sharing those stories because a lot of women don't, and I can imagine that the hurt uh, must have been devastating at the time. And these are deeply personal stories, so thank you for sharing them. Um, and I, I, I don't even know where to start because it's very real. What you're saying is not, we can't sugarcoat it. We can't act like we don't have some broken systems and some churches that, um, that you know, this is the thing, churches run by man. So just like any, you know, religion, they're run by men. And I mean men in the broad sense, women and men, humanity. And we're, so when they're run by humanity, you're dealing with some of the you know, challenges of humanity. And like uh, Malaka said and, um, and Ekuba illustrated, a lot of people run to the church when they are in deep need. 
especially in places like West Africa or other parts of Africa or other parts of the developing world where you don't really have a lot of other options. So if you are struggling with a mental health issue, you don't have anywhere else to go really. If you are struggling with an illness, you may our healthcare standards are not up to par. So you really don't have a lot of other places to go. You are reliant on miracles, right? And I think I believe miracles happen. So when I did the quotes is not because I have a problem with miracles. What I have a problem with is these um <sighs> these, unscrupulous. He, uh, I feel like unscrupulous is not even. We need something. These demons, really, essentially, really, in wolves. You know, they they stand in a place of power, right? And, 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 and to be honest, maybe not all of them start out that way, but it's really intoxicating the level of power that a lot of these men are given, uh, even women for that matter. But you know, these people in a position of power, they are given such levels of reverence and worship. A lot of people indulge in. in pastor worship and um, and so you're looking up at the man miracles follow the man the reality is miracles don't follow any man miracles are part of your relationship with God and really we should we really are empowered enough that we should be able to you know if God's gonna bless you, he's gonna bless you regardless it's not through some man and so you see people doing things and accepting things and 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 just believing everything hook line and sinker that comes out of the word of a man without having any connection or verification or checking like is this real and then there's very little accountability as um, Ekuba in, talked about when she said she went to the church and nothing was done so there's very little accountability nobody wants to talk about it they sweep it under the rug uh, there was some scandal in um, in Abuja recently I guess a big church I've never heard of the church but a big charismatic church like you said and a similar thing we don't know if it's true or not but the pastor was supposed to be sleeping with a number of young girls or something like that and nothing was done he's still preaching today um, and you know when I think about the scripture and this is the thing that I, I always it hurts me deeply and you know there's a line there's a, a word that says that teachers will be judged more harshly when the day of judgment comes and I think that that's in line because it's heartbreaking to see so many people turn away from the message of Christianity because of these sorts of experiences that are not indicative of God's love. At the end of the day, the message of Christianity is love, period. And so when you have women that are raped in many ways, she perform your a counselor utilizing that opportunity when you are emotionally vulnerable, it is a form of rape. You know, uh, a pastor use, utilizing that power over you, it is a form of rape. And the truth is, in West Africa, I don't know how it is in Ghana, but we really don't have adequate ways to deal with rape, even as a society. Let's not just talk about the church. Right. So we have deep issues, right? And, and I agree. There are really deep issues. There's a lot of abuse going on. And I think that what we have to begin to do is, one, become more open as Ekuba has said, you know, and I, that's why I'm really grateful for this conversation, right? Because it's very easy for someone to walk away from the church and say, you know, the church is done, whatever, or the mosque or whatever the faith is, you know, they're just hypocrites or whatnot. And it's very easy to discount someone else's testimony because that is what she's sharing her story by saying, oh, she's just angry at the church. No, these are real things. Let's talk about them. Let's look at it and let's put some structures in place. I know pastors that have glass windows in their offices. I know pastors that will not counsel a woman without another person in the room. And those are boundaries because I, I respect people that do that because that means they understand that they're human. And they too are prone to the things that humans are prone to. I myself, I feel like there are boundaries I set in place for myself. Just I'm not even in a position of leadership, but just day-to-day -day living. I set boundaries for myself because I recognize I am prone to everything everybody else is prone to. I'm prone to those things. Just because I profess faith does not mean that I don't need to put myself in check. And we need to put these checks and balances in the church to protect our people. Mm -hmm. We need to do that and speak up and stand up and walk out if need be mm -hmm. when someone is not being true to the word. You can't, we can't keep ignoring it and pretending. Because people are literally being destroyed right. through this. So I'm so, I, I, I just got a little hot. I'm sorry. I, got a little hot. <laughs> no, I, just, I, I would like to chip in and say that probably the cynicism for some of us that are outside the church is that it's interesting that a lot of church members and then pastors and Christian organizations are very passionate about certain issues. 
you have Christians going on matches about abortion, about uh, about other things, but you hardly ever have Christians going on that, that there's too much corruption in the church or there's too much abuse of people going on in the church. Let me use Ghana as an example, right? We had, I think, the Christian, was the Christian Council of Ghana Canary to make, uh, to have a press conference that was sexuality, the Catholic Bishops Conference, having conferences. There's been several cases of pastors in Ghana raping people. There was a case of the Jesus One Touch thing. There was a case of pastors sleeping with the church member. The moderator of the Presbyterian Church came and gave a press conference, I think, a week ago. Like a few weeks before something, there was a case about an Anglican priest that we know, but then the Attorney General's office refused to prosecute it. Some months earlier, there was a case about his own church, a uh, head of, according to a particular head of ministry there, that had done something. I think they said he had slept with some men against their will or something. But what interests me is that I never see any organization by Christians who put these things. Whenever it happens, they are always so there, they're saying that, oh, they are, you know, say this wrong, but then they are just men. It kind of makes me feel you know, doubtful about their priorities. Firstly, to campaign about certain things, but then other matters are like, oh, it's kind of bad, but then we won't really campaign about it. These are some of the worries that I have. I think those are valid worries. I'm sorry to Nana to just jump in, but I think what you said there it's valid, right? So we spend a lot of energy focusing on legal things that may not be as pertinent, right? Um, and how do we deal with that? How do we how do we handle that? I think there needs to be a level of awareness. I think that there's a lack of awareness of how much damage is being done. I think the average person that's in the congregation doesn't even really know because they've never experienced it. So they may not know, and they may think it's a one-off thing. And, and, and I just wanted to point out something about your experiences. Um, I think it's really important to note that there are many churches, like um, Malaka said, like on one, one street there are like eight churches, right? So there are many, many churches and houses of worship and um, churchpreneurs, right? Um, and they're not all, obviously they're not all of God. And I think it's important that we don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Mm -hmm. There's so many people that, and that's the danger, right? In the sorry, uh, sorry, Kuba, but I just have to drop in that line of scripture that says, "In the last days, there will be so many false prophets." So there are many of them, and they're doing all sorts of things, and they're under the, you know, they're saying all sorts of things and 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 damaging people. You know, even people that are highly fundamental that are coming from, you know, you can't do this, you can't do that. That's their interpretation. I don't think a, a relationship with God is meant to put you in any form of bondage. You should not feel con confined, that you can't live, that you can't read certain books. I, I mm -hmm. thought that. And I was like, oh my gosh, how can you, someone legislate what you can read what and you can read? read? <laughs> That's ridiculous. And I read widely, right? And I'm never afraid. A lot of people are afraid to read different texts for fear that their minds shall be corrupted. But, you know, we serve a God that does not say, limit yourself. There's even a verse that says, come let us reason together. So there's a, con you know, this has been a deliberate attempt by certain people, certain groups or whatever, or people who want to control people by telling them, oh, you're not supposed to reason, you're not supposed to question, you are supposed to question, you are supposed to reason. You, you can go back to God and say, I don't understand this. You know, and, and I really genuinely believe in that relationship. And so I, I just wanted to, to, to leave that there to say that these experiences are not indicative of the whole, while they are important and must be addressed, and we do have to begin to look at that in the church. If we want a church that is effective and, and a church that is a place that people can come, at the end of the day, I feel like when you went to Jesus, you got love. You didn't leave. If you were hungry, you got fed. If you had a burden, it got lifted. And that should be happening. If it's not happening in your church, then you need to be checking it. Like, maybe this is not the place for me. Honestly, and, and also check yourself too, though. Am I in relationship? You know, I think it's a personal thing. But we do be, I agree with you, Akuba. We need to begin to work on that. We need to begin to create awareness. We need to be able to stand up. And stuff that even women like you are in a great, have a great opportunity because you can share these stories. I haven't experienced these stories, right? I've be, I'm beginning to hear more and more of them, and I know how damaging they are. Um, but I really appreciate hearing the stories, particularly when someone has left the church as a result of it, right. because it, it shows the devastation. 
Um, and, and it's important for us to share these stories and without judgment, just to sit and, and you know. So I, I, I am changed already from this conversation. And um, Ikuba, thank you very much so much. It's just incredible that you've been willing to share at that level. I just wanted to jump in and ask that, um, <laughs> okay, first of all, I didn't leave because of these things that happened because these are like several years back and I stayed in the church way past that, so it wasn't because of these experiences. And I also wanted to ask that my particular problem is the fact that there's a lot of silence by the Christian community. For example, why did the churches in Nigeria not complain when it was put on video camera that Bishop Oye Dupo slapped a minor? Why was there no complaints by any single, I didn't see any, church, any complaints by a group of Christians saying that this is bad. There's a lot of silence when those things happen and everyone acts like they don't know that it's going on. These are some of the issues that I have. You I think see. that's inaccurate. I'm sorry, I have to jump in there. I think that that's very inaccurate. There was a lot of discourse. Now, there may not have been public discourse. We, we might be having a conversation. We might be up in arms, but we don't necessarily have power or media behind us. So it doesn't mean that we're giving uh, implicit approval of that sort of behavior. If you looked at any of the blogs that covered that, you would see comments in the hundreds that are standing up against that sort of behavior. So I think there is a large level of displeasure with what is going on. Now, the fact that other uh, of the leadership are not speaking up, that's something to think about, and how do we begin to address it? I don't. Uh, what I don't want to do is create a situation where we are creating just opposition without any room for resolution. So there has to be resolution, I agree. Right? Things have to change. But we can't just say all Christians are accepting of this. It's not true. It's absolutely not true. Many of us are trying to figure out a way to create a more loving experience. And But at the end of the day, my goal is not to say this person is wrong and that person is wrong. That's not my job here. My goal is to create an, a, an opportunity for someone to experience the love of Christ, period. That's what our, my goal is. And so if what I can do is create a more loving uh, space by myself or with a group of people or through a fellowship where people can understand this is what God is about, then I feel like that's important. And as we go on, we will begin to create awareness and begin to touch lives and begin to get people excited and understanding that, you know, it's not about legalism. It's about relationship. So I, I really, I didn't mean to be so vehement, but I really think it's important not to just label all Christians as people who don't care and people who are trying to, you know, whitewash things. We're not. We're trying to and figure I don't, this thing I out. don't think Christians are, but then I think that as an organization, because I'm saying that if you had like the Anglican bishops of Nigeria holding conference about homosexuality, you had so many other groups holding such conferences, you had prominent pastors coming out to speak. And then when it's captured on camera that a pastor is assaulting a minor, suddenly there's like silence. Not one single pastor spoke about this thing. Unless I don't know if there's a recording of a pastor that spoke or an organization that spoke, that's different. So yes, I believe that individually Christians are caring. But I'm saying that as an organization, it's interesting what seems to be the priority. Yeah, I agree. And I'm just I'm gonna have to jump off really quickly. So can I use you? <laughs> well, I, I, I was just about to wrap up yeah. because it's actually it's one o'clock. <laughs> yeah. Yes. As we've been chatting for an hour. So actually what I was going to ask was for everybody to give their concluding, you know, remarks in about thirty seconds each on reconciling sex with faith or in a sense reconciling sex as an atheist or a person with no faith. So I'll start with you, Malaika, then Ikuba, then Ikene. Then, uh, I was gonna let Ikene go first because she has to probably yeah, go do some mommy that, stuff. Yes, thank you. I really appreciate that. First of all, thank you guys for inviting me to this conversation. And my 30-second thing is this, that at the end of the day, God is love, right? And as long as sex is a loving thing for you, then I think he's part of that. Um, and I think it's best in the confines of a loving say, a relationship like marriage. A, a marriage is the best place for it, of course. But I don't think that there's condemnation. I don't think that he's about shame. I think that wherever you are, you should be doing the most loving thing for yourself. So I, I have to say thank you, and I have to rush off, and I hope that this conversation will continue and that I'll have an opportunity to meet with you guys again. So thank you guys so much. Thank you so much, Akide, for joining us. Bye-bye. Okay, 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 bye. I'm going to go to Malaika now. Okay, so my 30-second thing is um, people, we live in the real world. People experience sex in different ways. People like violent sex. People like sweet and soft sex. Some people don't like to have sex at all. 
I think that um, when it comes to reconciling sex and your faith, you have to, first of all, if you are in some sort of faith, pursue that faith with, with love and with passion. And you know, and search within yourself. When you're doing something that doesn't feel right, don't do it. If it feels right to you, then do do it. Ask yourself, how does your God or how does your set of morals um, work with this? And at the end of the day, we all have to do what, what works best for us and deal with the consequences or lack of thereof thereafter. Thanks, Malaika. Ikuba, over to you. Oh, I would just say that it's been a wonderful opportunity. Thank you so much for this opportunity. And I would just encourage everyone out there that don't let anyone tell you what to do so far as sex is concerned or with your life basically based on some book or whatever it is. Think for yourself, read for yourself, and at the end of the day, do what you feel convicted to do. Thank you very much. <laughs> And thank you all so much for joining us. Malaika, Ikuba, Ekene, I really appreciate everybody taking time out of their schedule to be with us. Um, I'd like to thank everybody who is watching. I'd like to thank all the people who read Adventures. If you don't, you better start today. <laughs> and the address is www.adventuresfrom.com. The full name of the blog is Adventures from the Bedrooms of African Women. This is the very first Hangout, and we plan to make this a monthly event. So help us. <laughs> and please give us suggestions of topics where you'd want us to cover. We decided to focus on sex and faith, or sex and no faith, slash sex on being confused about faith, because we were just like, we're just going to go with this conversation and see how it goes. Um, and part of this is also as a lead up to a series that Ikuba is going to be starting for us. So we're very excited about your series, Ikuba. Yes, we we're are. We're looking forward. <laughs> we're looking forward to it. And yes, please. Join us for our next Hangouts, which will be sometime in February. Topic is yet to be decided. And thank you all once again. Bye. Bye.